From KQED Public Radio in San Francisco, I'm Michael Krasny. Good morning and welcome to this morning's forum. Christopher Hitchens, in his newest book, Thomas Jefferson, which is part of a HarperCollins series on eminent lives, calls Jefferson author of America, the founding father who gave us the Declaration of Independence and brokered the Louisiana Purchase. According to Christopher Hitchens, quote, did not embody contradiction. Jefferson was a contradiction. We'll find out all about America's third president in this hour with much praised and often controversial Anglo-American journalist Christopher Hitchens, author of over a dozen books, as well as contributing editor to Vanity Fair and columnist for The Atlantic. His work regularly appears in such publications as the New York Review of Books, The Nation, Harper's, New York Review, Slate, and he joins us for the second hour. Good to see you again. Welcome. Very nice of you to have me back. Well, I was uh, I was concerned. I thought, is, is this going to be uh, one of these... Uh, uh, Hitchens like jobs, uh, like the one on Clinton or Diana or Mother Teresa. <laughs> and, of course, having read Adam's biography, I thought Jefferson didn't come out in too good a light there. But he does come off in a pretty good light for you. I mean, you like Jefferson, don't you? You know, I, I may now have an answer to those very nice old ladies who sometimes come to bookstores when I read and sit looking worried in the front row and say to me afterwards, well, you seem quite nice, but we were worried because... You only seem to want to attack people. We thought you were unhappy. And um, Actually, when I wrote my George Orwell book, I thought I was finally able to say I could write in praise, too. But with Jefferson, it's it's a little more mixed than that. I mean, if you're writing about America, which I am, America being the great subject, you have to write about Jefferson because without him, the United States wouldn't exist as we know it now. And one of the attractions of writing about America is that it's a written country. It's composed. It's set down in founding documents, unlike any other country. It's therefore a work in progress, which makes it wonderful for a writer to write about. It's subject to revision. Um, But inscribed in the very beginning of those documents are all kinds of problems and, and contradictions, too. Well, the main document, of course, that we have to thank Jefferson for is the Declaration of Independence. And uh, what I learned from your book, I I mean, I knew that there was certainly a great influence of Locke. What I didn't know is that they dropped property and put pursuit of happiness. Uh, I mean, it was Locke who included property, life, liberty, and property. Life, liberty, and property. And when you look at the people who were met to decide on it, um, you you could certainly imagine that property would be uppermost in their minds. We're talking about farmers mainly here, um, and mainly slaveholders. So it was quite a renunciation of them in some ways to say, no, we'll take out property rights and we'll put in the pursuit of happiness. I mean, that's an extraordinary formulation. We still don't quite know, I don't claim to know precisely what it means. It could mean the pursuit as in the following of the prospect of, the pursuit of the prospect of happiness. Just the pursuit mean, yeah, itself. Or it could mean the pursuit itself, just... Yeah. Um, it's it's one of the many things that makes the Declaration imperishable. What an extraordinary figure he was, though, and I want to talk with you about the contradictions because they get into things like slavery in a big way, obviously, but a man who was really a Spencerian man in every way, a farmer, an architect, an inventor, a polymath, um, he considered himself a scientist. I mean, you, you look at, 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 at the man, Thomas Jefferson, just in terms of what he accomplished and what he did, and it's nothing short of extraordinary by any standards. Um, mm. And yet, as you say, in many ways a contradiction, and in many ways a mixed picture, particularly in some ways on that peculiar institution, because he was a slave owner, and he did in many ways not exactly countenance slavery. Uh, in fact, he was opposed to it, as you point out, and went along with the French Revolution idea that it ought to be abolished. And yet at the same time, <laughs> he was pragmatic about it, I guess you could say. Uh, to say the very least. Well, on the polymath point, I'm, uh, a thing I realized as I was writing the book is that when and see if this doesn't make your your listeners cry into their 10 o'clock coffee, the thought. When Jefferson faced Adams for the election for presidency, the, the electors had their choice between the founder of the American Society of Arts and Letters and the president of the American Academy of Sciences. Um, amazing to think that one had <laughs> candidates like that in those days. Not only that, under that old constitution, they could pick both, which they did, because the second one was going to become vice president. So it was not a bad ticket to be electing. And, you know, and in Philadelphia at that time, there are people like Benjamin Franklin, everyone knows about, but uh, Benjamin Rush, uh, Joseph Priestley, who'd fled England because the the religious mob backed by the king had smashed his laboratory. The man had effectively discovered oxygen. I mean, it's, it's almost like fifth century Athens. Suddenly at one point and in one place, there are all these extraordinary minds and all... Uh, reacting upon one another. All um, these extraordinary founding fathers, and you say 
in the book, Sally Hemings ought to be seen as a founding mother. Ah, well, I wasn't going to not come to slavery. I mean, the extraordinary thing about Jefferson is this. In his writings, and especially in his notes on the state of Virginia, he makes the perfect abolitionist case. If you read Jefferson on the subject, you don't need any more than what he says. It's completely unjustifiable. It would be unjustifiable, he adds, even if uh, Africans were an inferior race, which some people suspected at the time, thought they were. We were living in a pre-Darwinian time. Um, it, would, it was not only atrocious in respect of the treatment of Africans as property, but it, it had the most revolting effect on the white people who did it. It was degrading. It made them into sadists and rapists. And he, was, he didn't leave anything out. But he couldn't um, agree uh, to the idea of emancipation. In other words, he said they should be freed, but the, on the condition that they left the United States. They couldn't stick around, have to go either back to Africa or be settled in perhaps the Caribbean um, or the Isthmus. He couldn't imagine a time when there would be equality um, or anything approaching it. I think he was partly afraid of black revenge. Um, that bore itself out in Haiti as well. Which did, did bear itself in Haiti. Well, actually, he took rather a conservative view, but he was very. they were all very afraid of black revenge, and they were all slightly afflicted with a guilty conscience and didn't particularly want to see their former property hanging around after they'd been dismissed. So that would be contradiction enough, except that for, I think, um, several years of his life, he lives with a slave wife. He sleeps with someone who he owns, who is his wife's half-sister. His wife and Sally Hemings have the same father. Same father, yeah. Same father, and um, has several children by her thus showing, although in a rather shamefaced way, that coexistence is possible because um, though she was still property, all the children were, were freed and all of them were able um, in the census of 1820 to pass as white and most of their descendants, not all, but most now have, have ever since lived on the white side of the color line. And these were the only slaves he emancipated? Alas, they were the only ones he freed and it must have been as a promise to her. Um, he... We don't know whether he would have freed the others. On his own principles, he shouldn't have done because <clears throat> he could make no provision to send them to Africa. But it may be for even more base reasons that he didn't do so, in that he was going broke. Tobacco farming wasn't that lucrative in his time, and he managed his estate very badly. He couldn't afford to be freeing any slaves. Talking with Christopher Hitchens about his new book, Thomas Jefferson, you say, again, that she has agency, to use that uh, much-to-use word of our parlance, uh, and um, I'm talking about Sally Hemings, of course, and, and therefore give her this kind of mantle of the founding mother. Well, yes. I mean, she's, she's born, as I just said, her father and grandfather are white. Her father is Mrs. Jefferson's father also. Um, as a result, she's, she's not put to work in the fields or under the lash. She's a fairly senior uh, housemaid. She's still owned. She's still a slave, but she's, she works in the house, and she's evidently very smart and, according to all accounts, very beautiful. Um, and they meet, she and Jefferson, in Paris because she's considered responsible enough on her own at the age of 14, 15 to bring his baby daughter across the Atlantic by herself. Jefferson didn't know Sally was coming. He thought it was someone else who was bringing the kid. When she stepped off that boat um, in, in France, I think he thought, oh my God, um, and I think she thought I could do worse. She could have been free. She could have been freed. Slavery wasn't legal in France. Yeah. He couldn't have her as a slave there. Indeed, he had to start paying her wages. Or if, if he didn't have to, he, he began to, uh, giving her separate quarters to live in, hiring her brother. He actually, he'd already hired her brother as a cook to train him in French cuisine. We start to find note, entries in his diary saying, because he kept very meticulous accounts, so many francs, I forget how many, For it says dresses for Sally. I mean, I don't have to draw you a picture. And I think what she said to him was, all right, um, and she may have thought of it before she said it, um, but if we have any children, they're not going to be slaves. You understand that? And I, you, as soon as they're of age, you let them go. And that's what he did. So for a slave girl, she did extremely well for herself. Most people who are arguing about whether Jefferson did or didn't have this affair make fools of themselves because they ask what would he have allowed himself. And some people have said, quite senior historians have said, he would never have lowered himself to sleep with a black person. Well, that's, I think that's an appalling thing for a historian to say. Or, more morally, he'd never have lowered himself to sleep with a slave. No one ever asks, what did this very bright young girl want 
And what did she get? And didn't she have a mind of her own? The 